اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین شفیع ذنوبنا وطبیب نفوسنا وحبیب قلوبنا ابی القاسم محمد وآلہ الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین المظلومین واصحابہ المنتجبین ومن تبعہم بأحسان الى قیام یوم الدین بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری ویسر لی امری وحل لقدتا من لسانی یفقہ قولی اما بعد السلام علیکم جمیعا ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم we want to quickly finish off the topic and then discuss what happens next but the blessed prophet we have been talking about a three way dynamic system between the Quran the prophet absorbing the Quran growing through the Quran maturing with the Quran deepening with the Quran from the initial prophet in Mecca who is a mouthpiece to a prophet in the later phase of Mecca who is being addressed by the revelation to the prophet in Medina facing all types of different societal challenges and broader challenges the prophet who now takes decisions at times he takes decisions and he is perturbed at times he takes decisions and then the Quran justifies it later on at times he consults those around him to a very different pro- 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 prophet who is now a real and a true statesman a true leader who knows what he is doing and he is moving forward with confidence at the same time winning over the appreciation of those very close to him who observe his conduct so a lot is happening in this brief span of 10 years in Medina in Mecca the people who know him they know him in Medina is where the people start scrutinizing him watching him with suspicion observing every move of his he did not have a private life and a public life the marriages that he had were predominantly to convey his message to the outside world. And when we read the literature, nothing of his private life is left private. Everything is made public. So the Prophet was somebody who was extremely vigilant about the way in which he was because he was being scrutinized at all points. You can imagine that small talk takes place in his household and the Quran is revealed upon him and he is informed about that small talk that is happening and that is finding itself outside his household. So you can see how public his life was and how vigilant he had to be. Now on that note, we need to actually study the conduct of the Prophet, which obviously we haven't had the time to do so. And there is a, it's an impossible task to do that right now. But you can imagine how meticulous this person was. At the conquest of Makkah that we will talk about in just a little while, Uthman bin Affan, Affan who was then later on to become the third Khalifa, who was also the son-in-law of the Blessed Prophet. Well, you know the story there. According to some, she was the daughter, Ruqayya was the daughter of the Prophet, and Bibi Khadija, according to some, she was the daughter of Bibi Khadija from a previous marriage, and we don't want to go there. In any case, he was the son-in-law of the Prophet. So the Prophet had banished somebody for being an arch enemy of his during his phase in Makkah. So he said, look, this man should not be allowed in Makkah. Uthman brought this man to the Prophet and he said, Prophet, pardon him. The Prophet remained silent. He said, Prophet, pardon him. The Prophet remained silent. He said, Prophet, pardon him. The Prophet said, I have pardoned him. Then the Prophet turned to his <clears throat> companions and he said, I had given explicit instructions that on sight do such and such to him. Why didn't you do what I had commanded you to do? They said, Oh Prophet, had we known that that command is still effective at the conquest of Makkah, we would have done so. In any case, 
why didn't you gesture to us from the corner of your eye and we would have done what you wanted us to do at that the prophet said it does not befit a prophet of god to do such things the prophet of god cannot act in manners that are inappropriate to then deceptively look at you gesture to you at the from the corner of his eye <clears throat> when imam ali writes the famous treatise to Malik Ashtar on how to govern the state when he was uh, dispatching him off to Egypt. He said, Malik, when you talk with people, those who are around you, be they those who are proximate to you in your personal life or those that are unknown to you, give them equal shares of your glance so that no one feels that you have a favorite one. Why? Because the Prophet of Allah would sit in the midst of his companions and would give everybody an equal share of his glance so he does not do injustice to anyone. Can you imagine such small conduct of the Prophet? How far reaching it is. And Imam Ali explains that when the Prophet would sit, we would not be able to, the, on, the, the oncomers would not be able to distinguish him from his companions. And they would say, who is Muhammad Rasulullah? This is how humble he was. Now, I'll give an example just to demonstrate how meticulous he was. And I've given this on several occasions as we go into this talk today. That people would often give him gifts in form of food substances. He would consume and then he would give it to his sahaba. And thank Allah and thank the person. On an occasion, somebody gave him a fruit. He cut a slice and he ate it. And then he carried on and he finished the whole fruit. He thanked the man and prayed for him. The Sahaba turned to him and they said, Oh messenger, it must have been a tasty fruit. You did not share it with us. You ate the whole fruit. After the man had left, of course, this conversation takes place. The Prophet said, No, it was a very bitter fruit. I feared that if I gave you a slice of it, you would make faces and make comments which would be injurious to the one who had gifted me the fruit. And it would be bad for you as well. I wish to spare you and him. Now imagine how meticulous the actions of the Prophet are. These are the smallest actions because he was being observed so vigilantly by one and all. The man is something else. He is beyond understanding. The more I read him, the more I think, yeah, even though I don't like to say who is greater and who is lesser than anybody else, but truly the world has not seen one like Muhammad Rasulullah. It's a great shame that we are missing out on our, on our beloved Prophet. So now just to show you how rapidly things are happening on the macro scale. From the second Hijra to the fifth Hijra, battles ensue between the Muslim community and the Quraysh, which is the superpower and the trade center and whatever else you have with the affiliation of the tribes. You can imagine how influential the Quraysh were together with the Jews of Badr, that they were able to mobilize a force of 10,000 soldiers to come and attack the Prophet. At that point, the Prophet's army or his followers and his supporters were 3,000. Then the Prophet as a dream that he is going to perform the Umrah, slaughtering his animal, shaving off his head. So he tells his companions, I've had this dream. So they all go. They're not allowed into Makkah as we heard yesterday. The companions are now beginning to suspect the Prophet. At this point, you have 1,400 companions that have marched with the Prophet to Makkah. Now here is the character of the Prophet. The Prophet came out and he said, we are not performing the Umrah. Slaughter your animals and shave off your head. So the companions did not do it. So the Prophet was perturbed. The Quran is not being revealed at this point. The Quran is silent. So the Prophet is perturbed. Umm Salama, his wife, she said to him, O Prophet, you slaughter your animal and shave off your head and see what happens. So at the through the, at the advice of Umm Salama, he went, he slaughtered his animal, 
shaved off his head and all the sahaba who were carrying animals with them, they did the same. So he is a prophet who is not shy to take advice and he's consulting with them all the time. After this, we heard that the battle of Khaybar was fought. It was a preemptive slash defensive battle. The prophet started writing letters. He started to invite the tribes around there. There was a 10-year peace agreement whose clause was that these tribes, whoever wants to join with Muhammad may do so. Not Islam, but whoever wants to join Muhammad may do so. And whoever wants to join Quraysh may do so. Now, if they join Muhammad or they join Quraysh, then they enjoy the protection of Muhammad or Quraysh. And if they are attacked, then the right, the, 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 then the big tribe that is protecting them has the right to then nullify the treaty. So what happens here is that there are two clans that join with two different forces. Banu Khuzan joined with the Prophet Muhammad. Banu Bakr joined with the Quraysh. Now Banu Bakr, they attacked the Banu Khuzan and they killed 20 men. Banu Khuzan sent a message to the Blessed Prophet that we are your allies now. We are joined with you and we are Muslims. Although at that point there was no requirement to be Muslim or non-Muslim from what I understand. In any case, the Prophet saw this as an offensive and he saw that this is now something that breaks the treaties. Abu Sufyan sent a message to the Prophet. He said, look, it was a slip. It was a mistake. We are not a party to this. The Prophet said nothing happening. So the Prophet went with a force of, within two years now, a force of 10,000 Muslims marched towards Mecca. So you can imagine, a few years ago, he had 315 at Badr. Few years later, he's got a force of 10,000. Things are happening very, very rapidly. So in the eighth year, he approaches Mecca. Abu Sufyan comes out of Mecca. And he says to the Prophet, he said, look, our gods were unable to defend us. I'm embracing Islam. Now, the only way for the Meccans now to save themselves is to submit and to surrender because they've broken the treaties. The Prophet goes inside Mecca. He says, whoever goes into the house of Abu Sufyan will be spared. Whoever lays down his weapon will be spared. Whoever goes and locks his doors will be spared. So apart from a small tribe who fought with Khalid bin Walid and his force because the Prophet decided to march from three different routes to converge into Mecca. The other two groups got into Mecca. Khalid's was a bit later. There was a bit of a skirmish. So a few people from the Meccans got killed and two from the Ansar got killed. In any case, when the Prophet walks into Mecca, Mecca is surrendered. Now look at the character and the conduct of this blessed prophet. The very first adhan after the liberation of the house of God is given by Bilal. Now of course these people are horrified that he's sending a freed slave who is not an Arab upon the Kaaba or at the side of the Kaaba or whatever to give the first adhan. It was a very prestigious position to have. The prophet here sends Bilal. So it's a bit of a shock to both the people of Makkah and the people of Medina. Yet the prophet explains, the prophet explains and he explains again in his final pilgrimage that in the sight of God, everyone is same. There is no priority to one over another, save by God consciousness. And that is about it. Now, the Meccans were expecting that the prophet would take the keys of the Kaaba from the Quraysh and hand it over to one of the Muslims that had converted in Makkah. The Prophet took the keys and gave it back. He took the keys symbolically that now the Kaaba has been set free from idolatry and from shirk and kufr. Then he handed it back to them. And that was something that did not go amiss on their minds because they were greatly, greatly impressed. These are the very people who had driven the Prophet out, confiscated his wealth, waged three odd wars, conspired to kill him with Bani Nadir, so on and so forth, aroused Bani Quraidah against the 
Madinian Muslims. Yet he is behaving so magnanimously. You see, this is the mindset of the Prophet. He is not somebody who wants to conquer lands. He is somebody who wants to conquer hearts and mind. He is saying, leave aside these pagan cultures of killing and pillaging and indecencies and swearing and exploitation. Leave all of that aside. This is wrong. That is his concern. Now he leaves uh, Makkah, comes back to Medina. Now what happens is, there are three more battles. The first one is at Mu'ta. 3,000 Muslims go there. It was inconclusive. Then... The next one is at Tabuk. Now, this was a preemptive strike. I'm not interested in the details of the battle. I'm interested in numbers here. It was a preemptive strike because the people of Tabuk wanted to raid Arabia and they were endangering the people there. Now, sorry, before that, it's Hunayn. They were the Bedouins of Qais. And uh, with the clans of Huwazin and, uh, and Thaqif, they thought that now that Quraysh has surrendered and it is no longer the powerful uh, place that it used to be, they can go and take Makkah. Here now, the Prophet hears about this news. So he, with his 10,000 men and Meccans, give 2,000 people. At this point, they are not all Muslims. So the Meccans now are working alongside the Prophet despite their kurf, kufr or shirk or in spite of, despite not being Muslims. These people, they were attacked uh, and of course they waged uh, a pretty good uh, battle with the Prophet. They lost. Afterwards, the Prophet had to leave them because they were in fortified places. So the Prophet, after laying siege to their fort, could not get through. He left and decided to come back. Before he could come back, these people went to the Prophet and converted. So now there is a whole scale reversion to Islam from all of these Bedouins and these tribes. Now what happens is that the Christians are getting worried about the growing power of Islam and the Muslims. Now here the Quran steps in again because these are Christians. So how do you now spur the Muslims to fight with the Christians? Whereas all the verses previously that have been report, that, that, that have been revealed are talking of the Christians in a very favorable tone. That they will go to paradise and you can have wheelings and dealings with them apart from a few verses at some point that said do not befriend them due to the context. In any case, these verses were revealed or this particular verse which is in Surah Tawbah. Fight with the people who do not believe in Allah and neither the last day. Neither do they forbid what Allah has forbidden, what Rasuluhu or Rasul has prohibit, prohibited. And they do not abide by the righteous religion. From the people who have been given the book. Now you can see here, the Muslims are being spurred on to fight the people of the book. Now this, again, is an offensive slash defensive battle. Guess how many Muslims are with the Prophet at this point in the ninth year of Hijri? 30,000. So you can imagine from 313 to 1,400 to 10,000 to 12,000, to 30,000. When the Prophet took the people to that area, the Romans did not show up. As a result, now this was a part of the Byzantine, as a result, these people shifted from being allies and belonging to the Roman Empire, and they came into Islam. So this was how things were fast-tracked. Everything was happening very, very rapidly, and the numbers were growing. And of course, the last, last surah to be revealed was, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَعِيتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَةَ فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا 
when the help of Allah comes and you have the victory, then praise God. Now, there are one or two more things I want to say before we go into the last parts of this. So the Prophet had a dream that he had walked inside Mecca. He had sacrificed his animal and he had shaven off his head. It did not happen at Hudaybiyah. But at the conquest of Makkah, when he did all of those things, the verse was revealed, لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهِ رَسُولَهُ الرُّؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ Indeed, Allah made the dream that he gave to his prophet come true. But that was after two years. So you can see how things are happening. The prophet had a dream. It did not come true on that year. And hence, there was a lot of skepticism. But it came true after two years and then the verse was revealed. That you will enter into the house of God in amnesty and shaving your heads off or cutting your hair without any fear. And Allah knew what you knew not. So Allah is reassuring the believers here that look, everything is within a divine plan and things are happening sequentially and step by step. Now we come to the 10th year of the Prophet's life. This is the time when he does his first Hajj after leaving Makkah. Yes? How many people are with him? The conservative estimates are 100,000 people. From a person who fled Makkah 10 years ago to a person who was fighting for his survival to 100,000 people in the 10th year of Hijrah. Now he does Hajj. According to some texts, the verse was revealed, Today I have completed your religion for you. And people say, well, if that's the place where it's been revealed, then it means the final spiritual ceremony was given. I'm going to revisit this verse in a little while. The Prophet stood on the mountain of Arafah and he gave a sermon. And then the Prophet's last Hajj is extremely interesting because it was done in a very loose way, not the stringent, rigid way that we are doing it today. It was a very loosely done Hajj. People came to the Prophet, they said, oh, we shaved off our heads first and then we stoned and then we sacrificed. Some said we sacrificed first. The Hadith said that there was no manasik, but that the Sahabas had done it wrong. The Prophet said, it's all fine. Don't worry about it. The same thing happened at the time of Imam Ali. They all came and complained, I've done this and that and that. Imam Ali said, it's all fine. Don't worry about it. Allah has accepted it. It was a very different system that the Prophet and Imam Ali used to uphold and adhere to. In Arafah, he gives a sermon. He says, oh people, I have delivered to you what I was entrusted with. There is no superiority of an Arab over non-Arab, man over woman, white over black. You are all equal in the sight of God. Uphold prayers. Remember God excessively. Fast the month of Ramadan. Perform the Hajj, whoever can perform. Give zakat. Take care of the orphans. Be good to neighbors and each other. He gave all of these admonitions to the people. Then he said, O oh people, have I been true to the covenant I made with God of giving you what he entrusted me with? They said, Bala, Ya Rasulullah. Yes, O Messenger, you have. He proceeds onwards. Now here is the interesting thing. A man who has done all of this and struggled, not for 23 years, but for 10 years. I'm not looking at the... Meccan phase, it's a personal phase, he is growing, Islam is being given in essence. In Medina, Islam is being given as a form. Rights and wrongs, pray and fast, eat this, don't eat this, give zakat like this. A person who has done all of this, and he sees suddenly, from 3,000 people five years ago, five years ago to 100,000 people now, he is more than aware that these people do not understand what I have brought. He knows this, he's cognizant about it. He is aware of it. Shouldn't a person of that caliber be mindful 
of the community that he is leaving behind? And I'm a big skeptic of whatever the Shias and the Sunnis claim. I'm a huge skeptic. Bring forth proper arguments, rational proofs, and we can demonstration so we can test them out. Bring forth proofs. I, for the life of me, cannot understand that the Prophet was mindless of the real challenge that now awaited. It's a vulnerable community. These people don't know. There are Meccans, the Muhajirun, who are endowed with the essence of Islam. There are people from Medina who have grown up looking at him, his conduct, who are children who have become mad, who are youth who have grown up in the last 10 years. They have seen him, they have lived with him. The Quraysh don't know a thing about him. The, 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 the Kabilas of Saqif and all of these people don't know anything. The people on the Syrian borders who have embraced Islam don't know anything. The tribes that made allegiance with the Prophet don't know anything about him. They are just weighing it out. Which tribe will offer us greater protection and security? So he is cognizant, he is aware that these people are not cultured, are not nurtured in the spiritual essential message of Islam. He knows this very well. Shouldn't he be worried? Indeed, he is worried about this. He is worried. So now we find that you find a very stern verse come upon the Prophet. And I want to discuss this just a little while. Ya ayyuha rasul ballid ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. O oh, messenger, I'm going to use the word messenger, not the prophet, to just to distinguish between prophet and messenger, and I'll tell you why. And although this distinction is not right, but it suits me for explaining this. Ya ayyuha rasul ballid. O oh, messenger, convey ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. What has been sent to you from your Lord? Now look at the stern nature of this voice. Wa in lam taf'al and if you do not convey it, O Muhammad, then you have not conveyed his message. Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, and Allah will protect you from people. Now I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking. What was such a great fear in the heart of the Prophet that the Quran had to articulate it in these words that Wallahu ya'asimuka minan nas, Allah will protect you from people. So some speculate that this was revealed at the beginning of his prophetic mission ya yu rasul balligh but when you study the quran carefully you will see that he was never called ya ayyuhar rasul in those beginning phases of makkah maybe in the entirety phase of makkah he might not have been called ayyuhar rasul can you see that so you can discount that you can discount that ya ayyuhar rasul balligh we know the first surahs that were all revealed none of them can can accommodate this verse because the tone in which the Quran speaks with the Prophet at the outset of his journey when he's being nurtured and cultured into the language of the Quran is very different. Others speculate that this is the fear that he had from the Christians and the Jews. So why? What fear did he have towards the end of his prophetic mission from the Jews and the Christians? He has already defeated them. They've already been driven out. The, the, the Byzantines and, and, and the Christians are all coming towards Islam now. The Ethiopians have come towards Islam. The Yemenis have come towards Islam. The Egyptians are inclined towards Islam. What fear? So you see, no matter how you try to place this verse, it's not being placed. Then the other option that the Sunnis and the Shias both give is, it was on the return from his final pilgrimage. Ya you are Rasul. Ya you are Rasul. Ballig ma unzila ilayka min rabbik. Convey what has been revealed to you from your Lord. It's a very strong tone. And if you do not, then you have not conveyed the message of the of, of your Lord. And Allah will protect you from people. Now, Shia and some Sunni and Shias, they say, this verse was revealed and people, the Prophet stopped everybody at Ghadir Khum. Now, this makes perfect sense to me. You've got a hundred thousand who are immediately accompanying him. How many more are there of women and children and men who have not joined him might be five times more. Can you see that? Or four times more. These are just eligible men who are joining him. So you can imagine 100,000 means half a million plus. 
He is worried and he knows that these people are vulnerable and these people don't really understand Islam because they just haven't had the time. So here we find from Sunni and Shia that the Prophet stops them and says, gives an extensive khutbah in which he eulogizes God in the way that we do not find him eulogizing previously. And he says, as he said in Makkah, I fear I will be called upon to my God before the next pilgrimage. And he goes through the khutbah. At one point he says, recites the verse of the Quran, Do I not have a greater right upon you? Do, does Allah and his messenger, no, do Allah and his messenger not have a greater right upon the believers than they themselves? They all said yes, because that's the verse of the Quran. Then he calls Imam Ali and he says, Man kuntu mawla fahada Ali mawla. Whoever's Mawla I am, Ali is his Mawla. Now, after that, from the uh, Sunni text, we have the tent was pitched, Imam Ali sat inside, and the people one by one were going and congratulating Imam Ali. Now, now you think about this carefully. In response to this, or in the interpretation of this event, we have this interpretation given by our Sunni brothers, that Mawla meant friend. And it was only because there were many people who hated Imam Ali because he was very stern and strict in application of the rule of God. And therefore the Prophet wanted to nullify this enmity. Now, I'm just saying, you could have just said, Man kuntu mawla, fahad ali and mawla, and leave it at that. And just leave it at that. Even if the sentences that come after, Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man ada, O oh God, be a friend to the one who is a friend to him and be an enemy of the one who is an enemy to him. Even if that is cut out, yes, e e e even if that is there, it's fine. You can say, but when you ask for a tent to be pitched and for people to go in and congratulate Imam Ali, it is not on the basis of friendship. And we know that. It's quite obvious that the Prophet was choosing his candidate to lead them and the prophet's heart was filled with fear that these people hate this man they really and truly hate him because look at the hero of the battles in Badr it's Ali in Ohad it's Ali defending the prophet till the very end in Khandak it's Ali in Khaybar it's Ali Ali alayhi, made enemies galore if they had hated the Prophet, they couldn't do anything about it. But with Imam Ali, he was very young. If they hate him, they really do hate him. So this is the Prophet making contingency planning for his community. And I don't want to make this sectarian, but I'm just saying that the Prophet was mindful. He was mindful that these people are vulnerable and they need, they need somebody like Imam Ali to actually take them through. And if Imam Ali had had 30 years, you know, I don't think he would have been concerned with expanding Islam because the Prophet, to the best of my knowledge, has never fought a battle in order to conquer lands. Of all the battles that you see in the 10 years of the prophetic life, they were either with the Quraysh, in which case there was a constant state of war declared with the Quraysh and the Madanis, a Madinian people, until the Sul Hudaybiyah. Or either they were defensive, preemptive, preemptive, defensive. The Prophet never ever wanted to spread Islam far and wide in the way that we understand that he wanted to gain territory. I mean, even though the Sahaba did it and they were very magnanimous to the Jews and the Christians and they allowed them all to coexist harmoniously and that is commendable, but I doubt that Imam Ali would have done that. He would have probably focused on those people who are already within the folds of Islam. And he would have probably tried to put in processes where they understand proper Islam. So at not giving Imam Ali the Khilafah, a lot of wrong is, has been done. And that is for sure. That is for sure. Now, obviously, on the side of the Khalifa Abu Bakr and Khalifa Umar, they said, well, we didn't plan uh, Saqifah. Saqifah was happening anyway. What are we supposed to do? These are all debates that we need to go through. The one debate I want to come to here is that, therefore, do we say that the whole of Khilafah is illegitimate? That they were not legitimate people? 
I want you to listen with minds today. Yes? And carefully listen to this. Look at the ways of our world. Was Saqifa confined to 1,400 years ago on the outskirts of Medina? Or do we find constant Saqifas taking place every time? Within our own community, every election that is happening at the umbrella level, they are all being contested, aren't they? That this candidate was the winner, you gave it to the loser. Or this candidate employed Muawiyah-like tactics, right, to, to, to gain victory. Sakifas are happening on a daily basis. What do we do? For the betterment of the whole community, we patch things up, reconcile and move on, don't we? Isn't that what we've been doing in the last 22 years or whatever? Even at the level of Islamic states, you will always find that the person who's heading the state, you will find somebody else is better. And they will always raise objections that, look, he was more learned. That person wasn't qualified enough. We find that, don't we? This is the real human life. Welcome to it. It's not an ideal situation. That's how human beings are. That's how we will always be. We are supposed to progress, keeping in mind our frailties. We are frail people. People will play games, will become political, buy out preachers, so on and so forth. Like Muawiyah did. He did. He bought out preachers. This is the way life is. What we do is we try and do our best to be a little bit better the next time around. And we, we say, okay, these were the mistakes. We don't want to repeat them going forward. This is how Imam Ali understood the situation. He said, okay, fine. Now let's move on for the betterment of the entirety of the community. Imam Ali reconciled at that point. He was the most eligible. He was the champion. He was the favored one of the Prophet. But Quran did not mandate his wilaya because there's no verse in the Quran. There isn't. And that gives that leverage that, okay, somebody else can be the Khalifa. Now, can we say that uh, Khalifa Abu Bakr, Khalifa Umar, Khalifa Osman, they were not Khalifa? Of course not. It's a historical fact. They were Khalifas. It's a historical fact. They lived. They ruled. They made mistakes. I get it. They made mistakes. They did things that were not right. They did a lot of right things as well, as Imam Hussein says in one of his letters to the people of Basra, that, yeah, of course, we are grieved that was at what has happened to us. But at the same time, they try to do a lot of good. We pray for them and as we pray for ourselves, we seek forgiveness for them as we seek forgiveness for ourselves. You see, the Muslims need to understand. We need to move on now. What is happening is, you've got the Sunnis, you've got the Shias drumming in their sectarian messages. Guess who is suffering? Islam is suffering, the Muslims are suffering. Had it not been for the pulpit on both sides, the people on the ground, you would not be able to distinguish a Sunni from a Shia. They would be praying together, they would be fasting together, they would be intermarrying with what they used to do at one point, and life would be perfectly fine. Exactly what the Prophet did not want and what Imam Ali did not want, the heads of religious sects have done. They've torn it apart fully. The important thing here is to remember here is, that and how can they do otherwise when religious establishments are within hierarchies that are funding them and paying them? Of course, they are going to promote the message of the hierarchies. One country is paying one type of uh, uh, sect, the other country is pay, paying another type of the sect. And there you go. Keep it alive. It suits us all. It is here that we need independent establishments who can have a voice, who can speak who can go back into the text, can unearth these things and show them, who can invite Sunnis and Shias and Muslims and non-Muslims, come and sit together, look at your differences, reconcile or explain them away or reconsider, introspect. But the price of independence when you have giants around you is what? Suffocation, death, defamation. You know this. Independent establishments cannot survive. They get suffocated. They get killed. Yes? 
You see, today, the Sunnis are crying. They're saying, Imam Hussein does not belong to Shia. But the Shias have stolen him. And I will say, it's true. The Shias have stolen Imam Hussein. You are fools. He is yours. I will say to the Muslims, we are fools. Imam Hussein belongs to humanity at large. This is our failure. Prophet Muhammad belongs to one and all. This is our failure. You see, we need institutions who can grow independently, without any coercion, without any force. The reason why I've set up this prelude is because a place like al Madi Institute needs to grow. It needs to increase its activities. It needs to expand. And it can only do so when God-conscious souls who are mindful of God and Muhammad Rasulullah and Ali ibn Abi Talib and Hussein ibn Ali and that we will stand before Allah and his messenger feel a sense of responsibility to assist it and allow it to grow. That's the only way these institutions will grow. Otherwise, compared to the giants that have every resource at their hand and all the public platforms at their hand and all the preachers that they pay to speak, places like these will not exist. But if you are mindful of our own security in this world and the hereafter, if you want to finish off this sickness of sectarianism, then support establishments that are independent. When you say that there is no cursing that is ordained by an imam, curse the first, curse the second, curse the third, the Shias get enraged. But it is not there. You can't prove that the imams have said this. Yet, they will push it down people's throats that the imam cursed Abu Bakr, Umar and Uthman. You can't find it anywhere. When you say that the door was not broken on Bibi Fatima, there is no evidence. Imam Ali just sits there and somebody comes and punches her and whips her and hits her. I mean, what sort of an idea is this? And then nobody talks about it for a hundred years? When independent institutions say these things, they are gagged. And the pulpits carry on feeding this sectarian narrative to people. So I'm saying, oh brothers and dear sisters, if we want the real Islam to emerge, support independent establishment who are free enough to discuss, who can bring Sunnis and Shias together and talk sense. And after which Sunnis and Shias can say there is no problem. There was no problem that Imam Ali had in the way that we are making it out. Imam Hussein was not killed by the Sunnis. Imam Hussein was killed by a wretched person and his group. It was not the Sunnis who killed Imam Hussein. It wasn't the Shias who killed Imam Hussein. At least these things can become open. I'm going to leave us with this little thing that Ali Shariati said. Uh, by the way, there is one thing that we need to take note of in this sectarian strife that Shias and Sunnis have. And this traditional branded Islam that Shias and Sunnis are pushing down the throats of their followers. Guess who the casualty is? The next generation. Have you seen how many of them have become disinterested from Islam altogether? It's no longer relevant for them. What Islam? What Islam? The one you go to the mosque and pray and, you know, that's the Sunnis and the Shias, beat your chest and that's it. Throw everybody else into hell. Is that the Islam you guys are teaching us? We're better off without such an Islam. So the casualty is the next generation. Trust me. Many of the subsects of the Shias have lost their next generation. The Sunnis and the Shias are next. You know, when the Pakistanis were telling me that the Qadianis are non-Muslim, I said, next it's you. If you have the audacity to call somebody non-Muslim, it will be your turn next. Then I said to the Sunnis, then you will call each other non-Muslims. Look at this sickness. Sunni says Shias are non-Muslim, Shia says Sunnis are non-Muslim, Shia within each other, Ismailis are non-Muslim, Barelwit with the Diobandi, Diobandi with the Barelwit, Ahl Hadith says both of them are non-Muslims. The only common feature the Muslims has is, what? To call the other one non-Muslim. That's the only thing in which they're all united, in the slogan that you're non-Muslim. Think about these things. God knows where we will be next year. Think about these things hard and Ponder over them. Support establishments like these so they can grow and at least, at least the essence of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, the essence of the blessed Imam Ali, the goodness that the Sahaba left behind, all of this can be explored and the richness of Islam can be given. 
And I'm sorry for giving such a passionate uh, message right now. We come to the night of Ashura. We have in our traditions, Imam Zainul Abidin narrates that he was unwell. Zainab was nursing him. He said at a point in the early part of the night, my father entered the adjoining tent and he was reciting verses O time, sorrow be your lot as a companion. At the start of the day and at the setting of the sun. How many shall you put the rest to put the rest, put to rest through death without you or time taking any substitute? Indeed, the decree of God has come to pass, and our return is to God. He said, I understood. He was announcing his death. I held back my tears. My aunt Zainab was with me. She heard these verses and she ran to Hussein and she said, then in that case, I will lose a brother. And she began to slap her face and tear at her garments. Hussein said to her, oh sister, bear it with patience. Do not lose sight of patience or none shall be spared. My father, my grandfather, my father, my mother, my brother, they were all better than me. Death spared them not. I too shall not be spared. Bear it with patience. We'll find in the Maqatil that the night deepens. Nafi bin Hilal says, I saw Imam Hussein emerging and walking away from the tents. I went behind him. The Imam stopped and he turned back. He said, oh Nafi, what is it that you do? He said, I follow you in order to offer you protection. He said, come near me. Nafi said, I went near him. He said, I inspect the plains of Karbala before the battle breaks out tomorrow to see its elevated places and its ditches, to see from where the enemies can hide in ambush. Nafi says, I walked with him. Then he grabbed my hand and he said, Nafi, the decree of God has indeed come to pass. We shall all meet with, with, with our God. Nafi said then, Hussein came back. He went into the tent of Zainab and I overheard their conversation. Zainab asked Hussein, O oh Hussein, have you tested the resolve of your companions? He said, yes, sister, worry not. They will die for me tomorrow. They will give their blood for me. Nafi said to Habib, he said, oh Habib, the daughter of Fatima is worried. She is concerned about our loyalty. The night deepens. Imam Hussein is in his tent. It is said that they were devoting themselves to Allah on that night. And the sound of their chanting of the names of God resembled the humming of the bees. Hamid ibn Muslim says that the enemies heard this and 32 of them defected from the army of Yazid and joined in the army of Imam Hussein. Lady Zainab, filled with anguish in the depth of the night, emerges from her tent to go and see her brother. As she approaches the tent of Imam Hussein, she finds it unguarded. In rage, she thinks within her soul, how dare Abbas and Habib leave the tent of my brother unguarded? She looks inside the tent and finds Imam Hussein in devotion. She turns back, intending to go to the tent of Abbas. When she hears sounds coming from the tent of Abbas, she looks inside and she sees Abbas in the middle of the tent, polishing his blade. And he calls out, O oh, sons of Hashim, what do you intend to do tomorrow when the battle breaks out? O oh, Abbas, O oh, Master, the decision is yours. Allow not the helpers of Hussein to die before you tomorrow. Least anyone says 
Hussein preferred his family over his helpers. Zainab was filled with emotions. As she retreated, she heard similar sounds emanating from the tent of Habib. She looks in. Habib is in the middle of the tent, polishing his blade. O oh, Ansar, why have you divorced your wives? Why have you left your homes? Why have you come to this wilderness? What should you do tomorrow when the battle breaks out? O oh, Habib, O oh, Master, the decision is yours. Command, and you shall find us obedient. Let none of the family of Hussein die before you tomorrow. For none may say that the Ansar valued their lives above the lives of the family of Hussein. Zainab was filled with emotion. As she is retreating, she sees Hussein in front of her. She breaks in a faint smile. Zainab says, O oh sister, I have not seen a smile upon your lips since we left Medina. What be the cause of this joy? She explains to him. He says, O oh Zainab, do you wish to see the loyalty of my people? Indeed, O oh brother, then stand behind the tree. Hussein calls out, O Abbas, O sons of Hashim, hasten to me. O Habib, O helpers, hasten to me. They come running. He summons them. And he said, O people, these people will not leave me alone until they have put me to death. By you giving your lives, I shall not be spared. I relieve you of the oath of allegiance. Take the cover of night and flee and save your lives. No sooner had Hussein finished his speech, that swords were unsheathed, and they approached their necks. O oh, Hussein, do you doubt our loyalty? Command, and we shall behead ourselves and place our heads at your feet. Hussein says, what shall you do? Hussein ibn Ausaja stands, O oh, Hussein, I shall fight them with my spear, then with my sword, and when my sword breaks, I shall throw stones at them, and when the stones finish, I will fight them with my bare hands, and when my hands are cut from my body, and when I am put to death, O oh, Hussein, if I am cut into pieces, then burned, then my dust, ashes are scattered in thin air, I will wish from God to restore me again, so that I may come back and give my life for you. Muslim ibn Ausaja says, I want to give my life a thousand times over to save yours. How fine are the man that God has given me. I have not seen such man amongst man previously, says Hussein. He says to the, to the people, if you have your women with you and children, hand them over to the clan of Bani Asad. For tomorrow after my death, my sisters and daughters will be made captive and taken away. Ali ibn Mawahir says, I came to my tent. His wife asked him, O Ali, what did Hussein say? He said, we will be killed tomorrow. And then, and for me to take you to a place of safety. And what shall happen to the sister of Hussein? She will be made a captive. Sorrow be your lot, O Ali. Shall the daughter of Fatima be taken as captive? And your wife be spared? Give your life for Hussein and let me be with Zainab. The battle commences. Akbar tastes martyrdom. Abbas leaves Hussein. Hussein is deprived of one and all. He stands alone, looks onwards, and cries out, Hal min nasirin yansuruna, Hal min murith yurithuna. The cries of the women fill the skies. He quickly turns, has a child lost his life? Kulsum brings Ali Asghar. Oh, Hussein, he dies of thirst. Bring a drop of water for him before you go. Hussein carries Ali Asghar, places his Abba upon Ali Asghar. He advances towards the enemy. 
He has brought a Quran to plead for his life. Hussein reveals the living Quran. He raises Ali Asghar. O oh, people, if you have any enmity, then it is with me. What wrong has this child done to you? Do you not see how he thirsts? Do you not see he is about to lose his life? If you fear that I will drink your water, then come, place a drop of water into his mouth. As Hussein pleads with them, they turn their faces and begin to cry. Hormala, sever the speech of Hussein. An arrow is released. Hussein holds his baby towards the sky, pleads with them. The arrow tears apart Asghar's neck. Hussein sees this scene and is gripped in a state of shock. He does not know what to do or what has happened. As the warm blood oozes into the palm of Hussein, he realizes his Asghar has gone. He trembles violently and he says, Oh child, like this shall we be raised in front of Allah. Unable to move, he cries out, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Finally, he wipes Asghar's blood upon his beard, looks towards the sky, looks towards the earth, moves slowly towards the tent. His mother rushes and says, Oh Hussein, have you brought back my child? Hussein gives back a torn baby to the mother. Allah lana to lala komi dalimin, was a young lamuladina dalamu, a yamun kalabi yan kalibun, matame hussein.